Hello, welcome to the Friday, November 6, 2020 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Interesting post from Xavier today with an interesting lesson, the obfuscating PowerShell code in particular, trying to spot the invoke expression command. Invoke expression, roughly equivalent to eval in JavaScript or exec in Python, is a PowerShell command that can be used to execute commands represented in a string. Now, this of course is often used in obfuscation techniques, so spotting invoke expression is often a good sign that you're dealing with malicious PowerShell code. But because this is such a popular signature, the invoke expression command itself is often obfuscated. So Xavier is going over some techniques that attackers are using to accomplish this and make it more difficult to spot this particular command. So if you're dealing with malicious PowerShell script, nice uh, little exercise here for you to go over these different obfuscation techniques. Well, Apple today released updates for everything for iOS, iPadOS, watchOS, macOS, and probably also tvOS. I uh, have to double check, haven't noticed uh, that uh, coming along yet. But that's very typical, of course, for Apple, because uh, these operating systems share so much code, they're often affected by the same vulnerabilities. Of note are three vulnerabilities in iOS that apparently are already being actively exploited in the wild. And I think uh, the set of vulnerabilities is also interesting because it's really sort of a neat little exploit chain uh, that you have there. First, we have a vulnerability in Apple's font parser that can be exploited uh, to execute arbitrary code. So that's how an attacker would attempt to originally uh, get access uh, to the phone by sending a message or something with a malicious font. Next, uh, we have a vulnerability that discloses kernel memory. That's often used uh, to bypass certain anti-exploit protection. And lastly, there is a vulnerability that provides a malicious application with the ability to run arbitrary code with kernel privileges. So that would be the final privilege escalation. Now, all of these updates are for the 14 versions of the respective operating systems for iOS. Apple also released an update for iOS 12. Uh, that's the older version of iOS that I believe uh, may be the only thing running on older phones like iPhone 5S and the like. And yeah, since I mentioned uh, the similarities uh, between the different uh, operating systems and also the similar bugs being fixed, the Mac OS Catalina update, which is uh, for Mac OS 10.15, actually just fixes those three vulnerabilities I just mentioned for iOS. So uh, Mac OS would also be a potential target here. When we're talking about uh, Apple software, of course, we're expecting the next version of Mac OS uh, to be released next week. Well, maybe the week after. Uh, be a little bit uh, careful uh, with this update. It may break some security software. Security software often relies on kernel extensions, which no longer really will work the way they worked in Mac OS 10. Uh, now, a couple of vendors already announced that uh, they moved to some new APIs here, uh, but I would definitely wait a couple of weeks uh, for any bugs or so to be resolved. And corporate voice over IP systems are being attacked again. Well, I guess uh, that never really stopped, but uh, we stopped paying a little bit attention uh, to them. That's never a good thing. And Checkpoint has a good write-up on what they're seeing as a systematic exploitation of Asterix, a very popular open source voice over IP uh, PBX, and Sangoma voice over IP PBXs. 
The attacker in this case is then using uh, these uh, voice over IP systems to call a special premium numbers that the attacker sets up. And that's essentially how they're making money. Back in the good old days when international phone calls still cost money, hackers often used that kind of access and then to offer discounted or free voice over IP services. But well, that has of course become less of an issue these days. So now they're basically just making these voice over IP systems call premium numbers uh, to get some money out of them. According uh, to Checkpoint, a total of 1200 organizations were affected by this. So if you do have an on-premise voice over IP system, take a look and make sure it's fully patched. So it's Friday again today, and with me I have another STI student, uh, Mark uh, Lucas. Uh, Mark, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Johannes. I've spent the past two decades managing the Windows infrastructure at the California Institute of Technology. Uh, my focus is Active Directory Architecture Exchange, and within the past five years, Office 365. I began attending SANS courses at the turn of the century and eventually joined the STI program for the Master of Science in Information Security Management. I'm thrilled to announce I just recently graduated and now have that degree. Also had the honor of performing several security reviews at educational institutions and in my spare time, I'm lead IT for Yuri's Night Global, which is the biggest worldwide space party every year on April 12th. And I'm a past distinguished director for Toastmasters International. That's excellent. So you're with SANS, I guess, as long as I'm kind of just from the other end. <laughs> yeah, now, uh, work for university, of course, has its unique challenges. And uh, that's sort of what a little bit your paper was about. Or can you just explain a little bit what the topic of the paper was? The paper covered a new feature that Microsoft introduced, which was DNS policies. And the issue at our university is we're sitting on the public internet and how do we manage split brain DNS at the university and do dynamic DNS registration there? Now, to put a little bit in perspective, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the size of your network and you know how many systems do you have sort of joining, leaving your network? Any kind of metrics uh, to tell us a little bit sort of what the challenge is like? It's Probably a little bit larger in my home network here. Just a bit. We have about 1,500 managed workstations and then easily 6,000 other workstations on campus that come and go. People are constantly refreshing. Being a research institution, many of the professors are constantly upgrading their equipment for the latest and greatest. Uh, overall, we have about 10,000 accounts that we manage on campus. And of course, when you say manage, uh, that's probably a little bit different than what sort of enterprise people are used to in a university like this. You have some special challenge that you had to really, you know, know what the systems are. And uh, tell us a bit on, you know, how WINS comes in there. WINS is like a protocol that I remember from back in the day, from my sort of early networking days, but uh, I really didn't expect this to be around in that capacity anymore. So uh, why did sort of WINS stick in this kind of environment? WINS stuck in this environment because it's a very easy way to gather information about any device on the network. So if WINS servers are configured on printers, on Linux devices, on Windows devices, on anything, they will happily give up their information to the WINS server, and WINS records the name and the IP address. And it has worked very, very well for us to keep track of everything on campus. It's an easy way to associate IP addresses to names, which oftentimes gives us the person without having to go through, well, the IP address is attached to this port, which is in this building, which might hold this person or not. And that is a big help on campus. 
that's why WINS has stuck around. We'd like to move to dynamic DNS, but there are challenges with that. So really more modern way to sort of manage a Windows network you know, would be Active Directory and uh, why not that? Why not just uh, you know, put your Active Directory sort of in the, in the network segment where all these hosts are in? The problem is Active Directory is your crown jewels. And so you want that protected. Our campus is sitting on the public network. We have no border firewall. So we have the challenge of protecting the workstations with individual host-based firewalls or firewalls that are maybe building-based or network segment-based. But a lot of our workstations are on the public network and Active Directory needs to be protected. So to do that, Microsoft helped us put together a situation where our read-write domain controllers are behind a firewall and protected. Our read-onlys are on the public net and that's where the authentication is. The problem is those read-onlys don't do dynamic registration they have to pass it to the read writes, and that causes a whole bunch of issues, especially when you're trying to do split brain DNS, because our read writes are on a private subnet and everything else is on the public subnet. So we have to have split brain DNS handing out the proper IP addresses in the proper subnet sections. Yeah, so that's a real a tricky challenge there. And now uh, your paper is about you know, how you tackle this with these uh, DNS policies. So explain a little bit uh, what these policies are about and how they really help you uh, address this challenge. I was hoping these policies would help us address the challenge because the policies allow you to designate certain IP addresses to be handed out when a request comes from a certain, a, another IP address. So a public IP address querying the DNS server would allow a public IP address answer, whereas a private IP address query would allow a private answer. However, when you put the policies in place, the policies take over the entire subnet. Therefore, dynamic registration doesn't work because everything in that policy must be hand entered. The other problem is anything that already exists, including things like SRV records, which are vital to the functioning of Active Directory, you have to recreate those within that policy. You can't use the ones that are there which means that if there's any dynamic update to those records, you'd have to go back in and put those in by hand. Bottom line is the policies in our situation are not helpful. Uh, they, I can see where they would be helpful if you had a small static server that didn't have a lot of changes where you could put everything in and hand out your answers. But in a dynamic environment like Active Directory, in a dynamic environment where machines are coming in and out all the time, they're not useful. So really the challenge here is A, being connected to public internet and B, having all of these systems sort of you know, dynamically updating as they join and leave uh, your network. And so you're stuck with wins for good for now? For now, we're stuck with wins. We don't have another option at this time. Uh, we'll see if these policies evolved. I'm hoping they will because they do look promising, but right now they're not where we need them to be. Yeah, any open source solutions or so alternatives to Active Directory or the Microsoft way of doing things that you looked at or nothing really that uh, is useful for you there? Nothing that's useful at this time there we do have a uh, unix based dns on campus uh, which is our primary dns however it is not 
configured in such a way as to allow dynamic registration, nor should it be, being that it's our primary DNS that, that governs our entire uh, namespace. Yeah, so uh, a real good challenge there. And uh, a link uh, to your research paper uh, will be uh, posted in uh, the show notes. Any final words, anything you're working on right now, given that you have a lot of spare time now after finishing your degree? <laughs> uh, my job is keeping me quite busy. Microsoft is putting a lot of changes into Office 365, and that's where my focus is. Uh, I, I am. Uh, looking to take some time off at the holidays and then get back into it and look at some more consulting gigs as well as uh, continuing my work with uh, Caltech and looking forward to Yuri's night on April 12th. Excellent. So thanks for joining us here and thanks everybody for listening. Talk to you again on Monday. Bye.